Hello, my name is Hugo and this is Hugo's Desk. As you know, I've been using BenQ monitors in production for a while, but this video is not really a review of the BenQ SW321C. I've always been very agnostic on my approach to software and hardware, and on this video, I want to talk about why you should consider using a monitor like this. Some of the topics I will discuss are relevant to anyone that are looking to buy a professional monitor. In my personal opinion, a good monitor is one of the most important investments you'll make as an artist. It will help you deliver the best possible quality to your audience. It will also allow you to have a deeper understanding of the various delivery formats of this industry. So in a way, this is the culmination of using this monitor, the BenQ SW321C, for 12 months in a professional environment. Full disclosure, BenQ has provided the monitor for this video, but as you know from my other videos, I'm always very impartial. I am not a full-time YouTuber, as you know, I'm a director and visual effects supervisor working in the industry, so this video is my personal, professional point of view. I want to discuss what I like about a monitor like this, but I'm also going to talk about some negatives and also some shortcomings, but always on a very constructive way. But don't get me wrong, I love these type of monitors, and the SW321C is by far, I think, the best monitor I've ever used. I do recommend it, but it's not perfect. But again, I, <laughs> I don't think anything is perfect. Uh, maybe, uh, hmm, maybe a Quattro Formaggi pizza is perfect. Oh, but, fine, it's no. pizza day! <laughs> I use these type of displays on a lot of different pipelines, ranging from visual effects, editing, photography, and grading. I'm not gonna read the specs, you know, you can Google that yourself or visit BenQ's website, or you can pause this frame. It's, it's, it's all here, <laughs> it's all here. For the past 12 months, I've been using the BenQ SW321C for two very different workflows. On the first workflow, I used it as a desktop monitor with macOS and Windows 10. I used a 10-bit signal coming from my Mac Pro's graphic card. This is a typical workflow that most of you will adopt. In my case, I use the monitor for compositing with Nuke, you know, using sRGB and Rex 9 viewing LUTs. I did a lot of photography using both sRGB and Adobe RGB, did a lot of Final Cut X editing, some grading in DaVinci, and on those situations, editing and grading, I used Rex 9 but also sometimes I had some sporadic work in HDR. A little small pro tip. If you use a monitor like this, don't forget to make sure you're actually using 10-bit. In Windows, it's very easy. You can change that both on the GPU software or on Windows itself. On the Mac, it's a bit more tricky. Mac OS supposedly auto-detects the 10-bit, and you can check if it's on if you go to the system's report and click on about this Mac. But I had a lot of problems with this in the past, where sometimes Mac OS doesn't detect the 10-bit, and, and you end up running 8-bit without knowing. If you have an issue like this on the Mac, I highly recommend using a software called Switch Res X. In that software, you can change the depth and also see the current settings, and it's much more transparent than macOS. You also have full control, you know, you can even display resolutions that are not supported by the display. On my second workflow, I use the monitor as a cheap Rexon 09 reference monitor for both editing, grading, and compositing. Because I wanted to bypass the operating system's color profile, I use the video card. In this case, I'm using the Ultra Studio Mini 4K from Blackmagic. This allowed me to have a true 10-bit signal going into the monitor using HDMI 2.0. You can use this pipeline on any application that has video out capability, like for example, you know, Premiere, After Effects, Nuke, DaVinci, Final Cut, Avid. This second pipeline is less common to most of you, uh, and it's probably going to be used by an editor or a colorist or maybe, <laughs> maybe like a control freak like me. You know, I use compositing with these kind of video outputs. Of course, normally you want to use a professional reference monitor since the SW321C and even monitors of this kind of, um, you know, this kind of spec, they are missing SDI, they miss scopes, you know, they miss interlace video modes and even a genlock. But that's why I was mentioning it was a cheap reference monitor. It works really well if you're, you know, using because, you know, it has 100% sRGB and 100% Rexon 09. It also has 95% P3 color. I will make a video about this topic someday, uh, since I feel most people think that they can preview video on a desktop inf environment without a proper video card. As someone who's been using a video card since the late 90s, and yes, I know I'm old. Editing is a joy. You work with two streams of video plus an animated graphic layer and perform an impressive array of sophisticated effects, all in real time, without rendering. 
All that real-time editing power gives you the time to experiment. There's no penalty for changing your mind. I can tell you that it's so much better to have a proper video signal. This means you have the correct frame rate, you have the correct color space, and you can bypass the ICC profile of your operating system completely. Of course, because of NDAs, I can't really show you some of the productions I did on this monitor during 2020, since they're not out yet. But I use this monitor to make video game trailers, cinematics, I did some visual effects for some TV shows. I also used it a lot for YouTube videos, <laughs> both for tutorials and even cooking videos. It's time to plug my wife's vegan and vegetarian YouTube channel. Check it out if you like good food. Because, you know, we all have to eat. <laughs> Bottom line is that this type of photography monitor is very flexible and it can be used professionally on a lot of different pipelines. It includes all the color profiles you need from factory, but it can also be completely manually calibrated to any profile you need for your own pipeline. And this is because it has hardware calibration. Now, here's a pro tip. Remember, when choosing a monitor, make sure it is the most versatile as possible in terms of color profiles. And especially make sure it has completely manual control. You know, you want to make sure it has hardware calibration so you can bypass the OS color profile. And this is really the key. You want to make sure you can control everything from sharpness, brightness, contrast, individual colors, you know, color temperature, and most importantly, gamma. I personally use Gamma of 2.4 since I like to work in dark environments and I do a lot of grading. If your room is a bit brighter, maybe try Gamma 2.2. Of course, this does require some control over your lighting, you know, if, regardless if you're in an office or in, on your home office. Maybe check this video at this timestamp for some ideas of how I set up my own lighting. Now let's talk about some of my issues, concerns, and some of the shortcomings after using this monitor in production for 12 months. The older models I used in the past, like the SW320, the PV3200, and the PV3220, <laughs> that was a mouthful, they all had 350 nits. But for some reason, BenQ decided to only have 250 nits in the SW321C. Now, before you type your comment below that we need 1,000 nits, have you ever been in front of a 1,000 nits desktop monitor? I was streaming The Last of Us Part 2 the other day on Twitch, and I literally had to put some shades because it was so strong at 250 nits. But, you know, jokes aside, HDR is just way too bright to use as a desktop. The reality is 150, 200, 300, who cares? Professionals doing visual effects, editing, color, or photography, they will never use the monitor at full brightness. Regardless of the brand, when you calibrate the monitor, you dramatically reduce its luminosity. For example, if you're grading SDR in Rexon 09, you're probably never going beyond 100 nits anyway. So bottom line is get a monitor with the amount of nits that you require for your own work. If you're delivering DCI-P3, sRGB, or Rexon 09, then these professional monitors like this one will do just fine. And the SW321C will be a great pick for your creative work. Now, if you need to master HDR, usually at 1000 nits, then you need to look elsewhere. Anyway, no one should ever use a monitor like this to grade HDR professionally. It's perfectly fine to preview HDR, but if you need to grade HDR, you need to spend at least 25,000 pounds on a proper 1000 nits 10-bit display. Sony, for example, has a great OLED reference monitor, and I know Enzo also has one. They're very expensive, and if you want something cheaper, maybe you can look at the Apple XDR, but that still costs 5,000 pounds and <laughs> without the stand. <laughs> but Apple's XDR display has a problem. It has no external controls. That means that it depends on macOS for all of its settings, which is a problem for a professional pipeline. It can be somewhat mitigated using a Blackmagic to an X uh, Mini 8K converter, but that alone is like almost as expensive as, a, as the BenQ monitor. No matter what you do here, mastering HDR is just extremely expensive at the time of recording of this video, so don't expect any miracles. Anyway, the Apple XDR is still not even as good as a professional monitor as people might think. I really recommend you watching this video. It's very entertaining. In fact, this channel is just amazing. Go and subscribe them now. One thing I do with a monitor like this is to play video games. I found that playing video games on professional monitors really allows me to watch the game as it was intended to be played, since most game developers use professional monitors to make the games in the first place. Anyway, I'm getting off topic. <laughs> this is not a gaming monitor, but it does work really well with an HDR console, you know, like a PS4, a PS5, or an Xbox One S or 
X or One or whatever it's called these days. I'm just going to be calling it the Xbox box because it's a, it's a box. It's just literally a box. I tell you one thing, if you play a game in HDR, it's, you're never going to go back. It's really seeing to believe, you know, it's amazing. I highly recommend, for example, Ghost of Tsushima, you know, Last of Us Part 2, Death Stranding, Gran Turismo. They have some of the best HDR implementations I've ever seen. Playing a game in HDR is just amazing. Also, this monitor is so flexible in terms of color management that it's a great monitor for games development, you know, since it allows you to switch from profile to profile quite, quite easily. It can also be used for quickly checking your game in HDR. Not to master the game, but at least to check it during development. On this same topic of video games, a lot of complaints people have with monitors like this is the response time, you know, the, resp the refresh rate and the response time. Obviously, this display only has 5 milliseconds response time. Well, <laughs> it is slow, but what are you going to do? You're going to really play competitive gaming on a monitor like this? Uh, probably not. Like, if you're working in the creative industry, you'll never need a faster response time anyway. Anyway, to be honest, I prefer color fidelity to speed any time of the day. The SW321C, remember, is displaying 1.07 billion colors at 60 Hz. And remember that most gaming monitors with very low milliseconds, they're not displaying billions. They're only displaying 16.7 million colors. And a lot of them are not even 4K. And let's face it, 4K is the industry standard. There's no way around this, you know. It, it's not going to go away anytime soon. So you need 4K so that you can work and deliver at the same delivery resolution that clients are expecting. Another issue people really get stuck on is the true 10-bit discussion. The older SW320 was a true 10-bit display. In fact, the SW320, the old one, was the only 10-bit display on BenQ's professional line. But the fact of the matter is that most of the 10-bit displays are actually not 10-bit at all. They are 8-bit plus FRC. I'm not going to go into what FRC is, and you know because we don't have a lot of time and there's a lot better videos out there explaining this to be honest most 8-bit monitors are actually not 8-bit either they are usually 6-bit plus frc at the end of the day the monitor can support and display 1.07 billion colors i mean I wish it was full 10-bit, of course it would be awesome if it was like the old SW320, but I understand that it's an expensive thing to build. So always look at this spec. There's a lot of websites that you can research this information. Again, I'm leaving some on the description. I think the question we should be asking is, should monitor manufacturers be more transparent about this? Yes, they should, absolutely. This is an industry problem. I mean, BenQ, LG, HP, Aces, Anzo, they all do this. All of them should be more transparent and write 8-bit plus FRC on the specs on the website. And perhaps explain to people why they have to simulate it to extra bits and what the costs implications are. The reality is... It's always the cost. It's always the money. And at the time of recording this video, the cheapest way to get a full 10-bit monitor is to buy an Aces or an Enzo or an Apple XDR. And they're much more expensive than this monitor. Of course, you could buy the older SW320, but the technology on that panel is pretty old. I don't think you should do that. I don't. I, I don't really don't recommend that. Anyway, bottom line, if you have the budget, do get a true 10-bit display. Regarding hardware calibration and the Palette Master software, I really like it. It's great to have a proper way to calibrate your monitor using BenQ's tools. It allows you for a complete bypass of the ICC color profile of your operating system, and you can have a lot more accurate colors. And, you know, as much as I love the factory calibrations, you know, they're good, but they're not good enough. And if you want to have more control over your monitor settings, you need to do hardware calibration. You need to calibrate your monitor. Also, the new hardware LUTs are actually much better than the old version. They are actually 16-bit 3D LUTs, and the older monitor was only 14-bit. On this software, you have have access to all the profiles, including Rexon 09, sRGB, P3, Display P3, and Adobe RGB. It does include HDR, but that's good. <laughs> like I said many times, you should not be using this monitor for color correction and HDR. Now, I must say the inclusion of Display P3 is very welcome. This is something missing on a lot of the older monitors, and it's a great feature, especially if you're delivering web design or developing mobile apps. But I must say, this software, <laughs> it's incredibly slow. 
For most people, it's going to be fine. You know, it takes like 10 minutes to calibrate the monitor. But if you're in a big company, imagine if you're an IT guy and you're doing 20 to 50 calibrations, this is going to become a problem because, you know, time just adds up. Time is money. Now let's talk about video frame rates. This monitor supports 24, 30, 50, or 60 frames per second, which you know, covers most of the frame rates you're going to probably be using in editing or delivering your creative content. But please note that, as usual on these type of monitors, frame rates like 2398, 2997, or 5994 are converted to even number frame rates. For most people, this will not be an issue. But please remember, I'm talking about video preview. So if you, this is only an issue if you're using this monitor as a reference monitor with a video card like we discussed. You know, if you're using it, for example, with a Ultra Studio, if you're using it as a desktop, then this is not an issue since you will be running the desktop at 60 hertz anyway. And just to be clear, the monitor accepts 2398, 29.97, and 59.94, but it plays them as 24, 30, and 60. I'm sure most of you are rolling your eyes right now. But, you know, this is such a small difference in frame rates, but this is really important for like maybe 10% of you. But I have to say it, it's important for video editors. But anyway, this is a photography monitor, so my issue is actually a non-issue since I, I'm actually really happy that it even supports these frame rates to begin with. Always contact the manufacturer for clarification regarding the frame rate supported. Usually they have documentation for this, at least BenQ has that. It's very helpful. So, you know, when looking for a professional monitor, always buy something that can do what you need for your pipeline. If you depend on these frame rights or even interlace playback, then maybe a Blackmagic SDI monitor could be a cheap solution to have on the side to preview these <laughs> strange frame rates. At least that's what I've done. You know, I have a cheap smart view 4K just for that, you know, just for that purpose. I also use it to sanity check because, you know, it's a cheap 8-bit display with no image controls. I always try to have different displays to check how different clients and different displays will see my work. That's why I always have all these extra screens you probably notice on my photos. I sometimes even go and do a sanity check on my living room TV, you know, which is a really cheap uh, HD LCD TV. Never underestimate the cheap solution because most of your clients will watch your stuff on terrible displays. But that's the point, I guess. We work and use very high-end professional monitors so we can make sure our work is at the highest standard. And then, you know, that work gets downscaled and encoded to a more low-quality format. Uh, in a small little note, for some reason, BenQ does not have the eye care functionality anymore, like the timer, the echo sensor, and even the no blue light uh, mode, you know. I used to love these features on the older BenQ monitors, like the PVs and the PVs. They really helped me, you know, like, because it helped me to rest my eyes when I forgot, you know, to do a break or something. And sometimes I was just browsing the web, so it was cool to have like a mode that was more relaxing to my eyes. I understand that probably BenQ thought, you know, photographers never want to reduce the quality and the color fidelity, but <laughs> come on, even photographers check their emails, right? As someone that suffered from eye fatigue and optical nerve damage, from working way too much. It seems like a small complaint, but it would have been nice if, if more manufacturers would do more on this front. The monitor operates in a pretty normal temperature, you know, that's what you would expect from an internal processing unit. I'm not sure this will affect fidelity over time. I don't think so, you know, because I, so far I've worked it in 12 months and I don't really see any change in the uniformity after a year. This is a common trend on other monitors from other brands. You know, they do get a bit warm. Uh, this specific monitor reaches around this temperature internally at its peak, of course. The HDMI connection is 2.0 and the display port is 1.4. They all support HDR10 with HLG Hybrid Log Gamma. This is a huge improvement considering that the older models only supported HDR10. It even supports a 12-bit signal. I actually do that on by PS4 and PS5. It converts it to a 10-bit signal, of course. The banding is very minimal. Now, as seen here, I'm comparing the SW320, the PD3220, and the SW321C. The image is much cleaner. 
Almost all banding artifacts are now gone. I captured the bit of Death Stranding and to show you the banding on different displays. It's very evident on dark areas and really in atmospherics. This is a massive improvement for both HDR films or video games. And this, of course, you can also use it as a, with desktop HDR because both Windows 10 and Mac OS supports it now. The anti-glare and anti-reflection are just mind-blowing. I was blown away by this. This alone is probably one of my favorite features on this specific display. It is the most matte screen I've ever seen in my life. It's very hard to show on YouTube because, you know, like it's, it's just hard with the encoding. But just look at the reflections and the lights here. It is so, so matte. The difference between other monitors and this one is huge. This is very close to almost a paper screen. It's also excellent for video editing and photography in bright environments. And if you use the included hood, it's even more matte. By the way, the shading hood is also matted with some felt interior. This is something that I think should be mandatory for all monitors to have a hood and especially to you know have this type of interior. It works horizontally and vertically. And so it's great for, for example, photo shoots. And of course, if you want, you can also use it for nuke compositing. I mean, just look at this vertical script. <laughs> it's a thing of beauty. The monitor is both Kalman and Panton verified. I got really good results with the hardware calibration. I tested the monitor both with Kalman and also with the BenQ Palette Master software using an X-Rite Display Pro. Quick warning, this is going to be the only part of the video that you're going to see a bunch of graphics. We're probably going to geek out a bit and we, it's probably going to be a bit boring. But if you want to skip, just maybe go a few minutes further into the video. I will try to play this as fast as I can. I tested the factory calibration on Kalman. Then I calibrated the monitor with the BenQ's hardware calibration uh, software. And then I tested that calibration on both Kalman and BenQ's Palette Master. This way, I could check the difference between the factory calibration and the calibration with BenQ. Goes without saying that although the factory modes are okay, I got much better results when calibrating with hardware mode. Which is no surprise, you know, in my view, the factory modes are just there for a quick and dirty calibration. If you want accurate results, you do need to calibrate your monitor manually, and also you need to calibrate it once in a while. Anyway, for those of you that are still here, <laughs> after all this boring section, uh, here are the results I got uh, with this monitor as fast as I can read them out. In sRGB, the factory calibration gave me an average delta of 1.7. After calibrating the monitor using the Palette Master, I got an average delta of 0.65. The same calibration testing it on Kalman gave me the average delta of 0.8. In the case of DCI-P3, factory calibration gave me average delta of 2.2. Calibration by Palette Master gave me an average delta of 1.38. The same calibration tested in Kalman gave me an average delta of 1. Using Adobe RGB, factory calibration gave me an average delta of 1.9. Calibrating it with the Palette Master gave me an average delta of 1.05. Then I tested it in Kalman and gave me an average delta of 0.7. And last but not least, in Rec. 709, factory calibration tested in Kalman was an average delta of 1.9. Calibrating with the Palette Master and tested in Palette Master gave me an average delta of 1.13. Calibration from Palette Master and tested in Kalman gave me an average delta of 0.9. As you can see, all calibrations were a pass, and all of them were below an average delta of 2, with some of them even going below 1 of delta. Every time we calibrate using the Palette Master, we get much better results than the factory calibration. I should also mention that these calibrations are from January 2020. I recently made them all again in January 2021, exactly one year after, and I got pretty much the same result. This means the monitor is pretty much consistent over time, as long as, of course, you keep calibrating it and treating it well. <laughs> so, pro tip, when planning to buy a professional monitor, always check the average delta so that you know what is the variation between the real color in reality 
and the color that is being displayed on the monitor. Speaking of light bleed, it's much better than the older Bang Qs. It's not perfect, of course, but you can barely see it when displaying black on a dark room. Only if I increase the ISO on my camera, you can really, you know, see it. And of course, this is now I'm going beyond the human eye can see, and then you can start to see the bleed. For comparison, is here is the same image on both displays. Of course, this is an issue with all APS monitors. They never really go as dark as we would want them to go. If you really want a truly, truly black image, then you probably need to look at an OLED panel. They are much better at achieving perfect blacks, but they are also much more expensive if you want to have this type of color accuracy. And before you start putting your comments saying that you have a great TV that has pure blacks, please note that these TVs, you know, the consumer TVs, not, do not have proper color accuracy, and they also do not have tools to calibrate the displays as they should. So you can use them, but you will never really get a proper grade out of them. The uniformity of the display is also much better than the older versions. It passed uniformity tests with flying colors with less than 5% deviation on the edges. It can charge a laptop with USB-C, and it's, you can still use it for data, but with some limitations. For example, if you use 4K on the display, then the USB bandwidth drops from USB 3 to USB 2. As I mentioned on my review of the BenQ PD3220, the new HotPuck G2 is amazing. It has a lot more shortcuts. I actually use it to switch my Mac Pro from Mac Pro to gaming and to other inputs as well, and also uses the wheel for volume. It's completely customizable and you can use whatever combination you would want. I really tell you that this should be mandatory with any monitor. It would, it, it's really cool to have a control like this. I don't think I can ever go back to a button menu. All monitor manufacturers should really follow BenQ's lead on this. This is a really small thing, but I do love the new boot up screen. It's gray now and, you know, not like purple, like the old ones, like the old BenQ displays. And it just makes it so much more professional. And of course, it makes your eyes much more neutral to work before a color correction. Regarding cleaning, you do need to be a bit more careful this time because a matte screen is a bit more sensitive than other screens. So make sure you follow the manual's instructions. Uh, it does include the cleaning roller, <laughs> which, you know, to be honest, doesn't really work very well. But, you know, if you have really, you know, a dirty screen from your clients constantly poking at your work, then you probably want to consider a non-alcoholic or non-chemical based liquid. According to the instructions, you can use them. I personally use this. One very niche but very cool feature is the advanced black and white modes. They were here on the older SW320, but this time you have even more settings and for different black and white levels. This is really flexible for any black and white photographer or film editor that are making a film in black and white. And that's it. To wrap this video, I would just like to finish with some suggestions for BenQ and also for other manufacturers for their next monitors. Please give us a way to to name the calibrations. Calling it calibration one, two, and three is just very confusing. The card reader should really be in the front since you know it's gonna be too hard for you to reach the back of the panel, especially if you're against the wall or next to another monitor. And to be honest, why do we still have SDI cards on monitors? I, does anyone even put an SD card inside a monitor? If BenQ wants to tap into the visual effects market, which I know they want, please make a Linux version of this software. I wish some manufacturers would find a solution to have two monitor hoods next to each other. This is a common problem. For example, I use two displays and I can't use the hoods on any of them. Maybe BenQ could revolutionize the monitor's hood technology by making something modeler. Imagine like having something that you could like put in sections and then maybe you could put it on one or two or three monitors. In conclusion, this monitor is the best display I've ever used. I know it's not real 10-bit, but the quality of the screen, the anti-glare, the HDR with 12-bit compatibility, the versatility and color profiles alone are so worth it. In the end, you should buy a monitor that matches your requirements. If you're a creator like me that is delivering visual effects, content creation for YouTube or digital art, then this is a great monitor because it can easily adapt to every delivery you're gonna make. Of course, if you're a colorist and need a lot more precision, then maybe you should wait for the upcoming PV series from BenQ and see what that brings to the table. Of course, keep in mind that there is always an exponential price to pay for more high-end features. 
I personally think a photography monitor is the most versatile display for a digital artist or a visual effects artist. For the simple fact that most of us are trying to create photoreal images. So in the end, photography is what we're trying to mimic. Why not use a photography monitor for that purpose? Oh yes, and by the way, it has a handle. Have I told you that it has a handle? <laughs> I can't tell you how much I appreciate that I have a handle so that I can move this beast around. Anyway, this video is getting too long now. So thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for bearing with me. Don't forget to subscribe. You know, it's completely free to subscribe <laughs> and it helps my channel a lot. Leave a comment below. I would love to know what you think. And, you know, maybe share it around. Share it with your friends. And that's it. I'll see you on the next video. Bye. Yugo's Desk is fan-funded and only possible by the generosity and support of my Patreons, Twitch subscribers, and YouTube members. If you like my videos, please consider supporting my channel on Patreon or becoming a member on YouTube.